Use cases are the preferred way for the unified process to express requirements so that you can analyze them further. A use case is a narrative document. It's a story that puts the uh, functions of a system into a context. It involves actors, uh, different types of users and events, things that they do towards the system. And the idea is not that these are requirements. They illustrate requirements into a story in a timeline. Uh, they view the system as a black box, meaning that you don't look at what's happening inside the system, just that you do things towards the system and you get a response back. You have different levels of use cases. You have the brief high-level use cases, which is where you would start out. And then you have fully dressed or expanded use cases where you've hammered out more of the details and you express more of how the, the use case is actually going to play out. So I'll be using an example in this presentation and in uh, other presentations. Uh, it's a point-of-sale system. It's the kind of terminal that you would have in a store, for example. You go up to the uh, checkout desk and they have a system where they uh, scan the barcode of items and you get a running total of how much you've uh, bought so far. And once they're done, you pay and you register the payment into the system as well. Requirements in this is, well, the basic requirements is that you can record the current sale, how much have you sold so far, calculate the current sales total, and reduce the inventory after the sale. You can handle cash payment, you can handle credit payment, and if you do credit payment, you can log the credit payment as well. There are, of course, other requirements as well, uh, quality requirements or quality attributes, uh, for example, that you have response time requirements, you have requirements on fault tolerance, uh, and you have system requirements on, for example, which platform to use. Um, for the interface itself, you may have other requirements. In this case, you have uh, the shopping basket thingy, um, where when you add items, when you, when you register items in the counter, you get uh, the impression that you're putting them into your shopping basket and then you pay for the entire shopping basket in the end. You have infrastructure requirements, thinking about what platform you're running, what hardware you're running, what database, programming language, and so on. And here is one example use case for the system. This is in fact an overall use case that covers more or less the entire system functionality. So you have a title, you have a name for the use case, buy items. Oops, sorry. Uh, you have buy items as the title of the use case. You have the different actors that are involved in this. You have customer and cashier. And you have a description that the customer arrives at the checkout with items to purchase uh, and the cashier records the purchase item. Uh, the system presents a running total and details about what you just uh, registered. And then eventually the cashier collects money and there's payment information and the system updates inventory. And ultimately the customer receives a receipt and leaves with the items. So this is basically what you do in a store. This you would then have to break down into small use cases that focus more or less on each of these different uh, lines here. But that's another story. Actors in a use case are they're supposed to be external to the system uh, and they participate in the story of a use case. If you remember me talking about stakeholders in the requirements uh, presentation, uh, a stakeholder is someone who has an interest in the system. Uh, but an actor who maybe who is a stakeholder as well, but an actor actively participates in the use case. So a stakeholder might be the government who wants uh, the tax to be recorded and registered properly, but they're not actively involved in each use case. So they're no, uh, not actors, even though they're stakeholders. Um, the system boundary can be a bit tricky to define because it's not a clear-cut line what is inside the system what's out, and what's outside the system. Uh, examples of system boundaries is the hardware. So in this case, the actual terminal, the machine that you're using, can be the system boundary, which means that if you have several different subsystems, pieces of software interacting inside this machine, uh, they're all inside the system boundary. Contacting the bank, for example, can be seen as part of the system. Um, if we put the system boundary at the border of the software, the point of sale software, uh, then contacting the bank, which even though it's done on the same machine, is an external actor. 
you may also take a bigger picture where you see the entire organization as the system. This means that you can have many different subsystems, many different machines, uh, even many different actors internally that together collaborate to fulfill your request towards the system. During these use cases, you get a lot of text and not a very good overview of uh, what use cases you have, what actors are involved, uh, and what the borders of the different subsystems or subsystems are. So that's when you start doing use case diagrams instead. This is a very simple view overview of a use case diagram. You have your different actors, you have a customer, and you have a cashier. These are involved in different use cases. Buy items, refund items, pay and log in. And these use cases belong to the POS uh, subsystem, or in this case, this is the entire system, so this is all we've got. We can see that both the customer and the cashier are involved in buy items, refund items and pay, but only the cashier has to log in. So this is just, sorry again, this is just to get an overview of the use cases you have and how they interact with each other. We're going to complicate this picture uh, slightly in uh, a different lecture where we uh, add relations between the different use cases as well. But let's leave that for now. Expanded use cases is when you, know, when you have more details uh, about a particular use case, you, you start using expanded use cases. You take your basic use cases and then you expand them with more information. This is not a new thing, it's just a uh, uh, natural growth of your uh, basic use case. You still have the same unique name of the use case. You talk about the primary actor, you list the primary actor. So in the point of sales example, the customer isn't really the primary actor. Uh, the cashier is, because the customer isn't directly interacting with the uh, point of sale system. The cashier is. Stakeholders, here you have all the different people who might be interested in this use case, Pe people and organizations. Um, purpose, why is this use case important? Why sh uh, how does this fit in with the rest of what you're the system is supposed to do? This gives you an idea of how to prioritize your use cases later on. Preconditions and postconditions are essentially a way to put the use cases into a context. So I can only run this use case if the following holds true. So I can only um, enter items into my point of sale system if the cashier has logged in first, for example. But if he has logged in, or they have logged in, uh, then I will go through the basic flow alternative flows possibly, and the post condition is a guaranteed result. This, if the precondition holds true, if the basic flow goes through, the guaranteed results are what will be the, the state of the system once we're done with this use case. Overview is the summary we had before, the same from the high level use case. Basic flow and alternative flows are coming on the next slide, so uh, I'll wait with them for now. Special requirements are if we have any requirements that influence how we interact with, the system, with, with this use case, uh, we will list them here. Technology, if there is uh, any supporting technology that will help us with this use case. And open issues, are there any things that aren't dealt with in this use case that uh, we need to uh, address later? Here we have the basic flow from uh, that I mentioned in the last slide. Um, we talk about the main successful scenario and we divide it into two columns, what the actor does and what the system responds. So the actor records, the cashier records the purchase items into the system and the system responds by presenting the running total and line item details. And then the cashier collects the money and enters payment information into the system and the system updates the inventory. And in the end, the customer 
which is a different actor. That's okay. We have more than one actor in this column. The customer receives a receipt and leaves with the items. If anything can go differently in this main successful scenario, we list them under alternative flows. For example, if the cashier tries to record a purchase item that doesn't exist in this store, the system should uh, present an error message. So we list line one, cashier records an, uh, a purchase item that doesn't exist in the store. The system responds by um, presenting an error message. So here's an example of an expanded use case. Uh, title, buy items with cash. Primary actor is the cashier. Stakeholders is the customer. The company, government, tax agency. And the purpose is that we want to capture a sale and its cash payment. Overview is from the overall use case that uh, a customer arrives at the checkout and the cashier records the purchase items, collects payment, and then uh, in the end the customer leaves with the items. Precondition, cashier is identified, so the cashier has logged into the system. Postcondition, well, sale is done, uh, we've got a receipt generated and we've recorded payment. We've updated inventory as well, presumably. Basic flow. We have what the act actors do and what the system responds. This goes on for quite a while, uh, uh, so I just took a few lines here to show you the general idea. Alternative flows. Line 2. That's here, that the cashier records uh, ID identifier from each item. That an invalid identifier is entered and then the system indicates an error. Later on, if the customer doesn't have enough cash, the cashier cancels the transaction. Special requirements for this use case is that if we, we have a touchscreen user interface, which may, interact, may interfere with how the cashier can interact with the system. We also have requirements on language interna internationalization, so the system must be able to respond in different languages. Technology, we have a barcode scanner. And open issues, we haven't dealt with the use case that w the customer can pay by card. This is just uh, by cash. So, once we have all our use cases, or at least a fair collection of use cases, uh, covering up most of what we think the system should do, at least in the first iteration, uh, the question is, which use case should we start uh, to implement? And the rule or recommendation is that we should implement use cases that significantly influence the core system architecture. So compare this with uh, the minimum viable product that Agile talks about. What we have is that if a use case has direct impact on the architectural design, we have to add classes to a domain layer, we have to add classes to deal with persistent services or something like that, when, then we increase the ranking of it. Uh, if the use case includes risky, time-critical, complex functions, then we increase the ranking of it. If there's new research or technology, something unknown to us, then we increase the rank of it. If it's a primary business process, this is the minimum viable product uh, thinking again, um, we increase the ranking of it. If it directly supports revenue, decreased costs, again, minimum viable product, um, then we increase the ranking. So the idea is that if we don't know what's going on, we try to do it earlier, so we have more time to deal with uh, whatever problems we encounter. And if it's a use case that takes us through the system, tests as many different parts of the system as possible, we do it earlier. Um, maybe we don't do we don't do the full database at, uh, in the first use case. Perhaps maybe we don't do the full user interface, and we maybe we only accept cash payments. But we will touch upon most of the different components we need in the system um, in order to complete the use case. That way, we have something which is a small product that can be usable. We can get money for it. Uh, people can start using it. We can get feedback uh, on what they're doing. The actual ranking can be done in a number of different ways. We can just do scoring. We can do so scoring saying that, well, on a scale from 0 to 100, how many points would you give this use case? We can do discrete ranking, so high, medium, low. 
high importance, medium importance, and low importance. We can just order uh, use cases uh, using bubble sorts. We can categorize our use cases in according to the Moscow principle, must have, should have, could have, and won't have for a particular release. Or we can go into more elaborate uh, uh, ranking schemes like cumulative voting. Let's discuss these more during the lecture.